They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Well, how are you? Anything going on? Anything interesting in the news? My lord, what an eventful time it has been. But things are looking up. By the time you hear this, we will have, or are just about to have, depending how quick you are on the trigger, a brand new president. And that's a good thing. And the official world of right-wing disinformation has been revealed to be the cancer on our culture that it is. Now, you've long known that, and I've long known that, but now it's out in the open officially, and as they say, you can't solve a problem until you admit you have it. But we don't have any problems. Not here at the show. In fact, we have a great one for you today, my guest, the very funny comedian Amy Miller. Now, in addition to being a hilarious comic, Amy has a terrific podcast called Who's Your God? in which people, many from comedy, discuss their religious beliefs and faith or, in my case, the lack thereof. Me, I'm home and I'm still wearing a mask, but God willing, that will all end this calendar year. Now, there are some cool things happening here that I can't discuss and some stuff that I can discuss. Specifically, Hanging with Dr. Z, which premieres on February 15th on YouTube. Or go to hangingwithdrz.com, H-A-N-G-I-N-G-W-I-T-H-D-O-C-T-O-R-Z, hangingwithdrz.com, for details. We're putting that website together as we speak. Or just follow me online and you'll get all the details you need. If you like this podcast, you'll love Hanging with Dr. Z. And lastly, a note of thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. Patreon, quite literally, allows us to keep making this show as it allows me to pay for the show. If you'd like to join, you go to danagould.com and sign up. It's five bucks a month and you become a Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet. You get extra interview segments. You get extra content every month. Here's an example. I was out in the garage, the coolest garage known to man, and I found a VHS tape with no label. I knew there was something on it, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a VHS hooked up. Five, six months later, I have the old VHS. Got a free afternoon. Hook it up. I put in the tape. And it's the raw footage of my interview for Space Ghost Coast to Coast from 1997. Remember that? So I thought, oh, this is interesting. I should put this up. So I digitized it. It's up on the Patreon. I took a lot of behind-the-scenes footage when we were filming Hanging with Dr. Z. Where is it? It's up on the Patreon. Now, uh, we have a really interesting True Tales from Weirdsville segment this episode, and in researching it, I discovered another story that was really similar, but weirder in a way, but it was just too much to put in, so it's on the Patreon. You go to danagool.com and you sign up. It's five bucks a month, and you get some crap, and you know that I'm grateful. That's danagool.com. And now... It's on to our filthy business. Hello, everyone. It's a it's a gray, it's a gray chilly day uh, here in uh, Falcon's Lair Recording Studios, high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf, and 
normally sunny Southern California, and uh, it's uh, a new year. If we if we make it over the goal line, things are going to be better. Um, and part of making things better is starting off a new season with uh, a new guest. We've never had her on before, but I'm I'm a big fan uh, of her stand up comedy. We actually came up in the same. Uh, places, but she came uh, after I was the, uh, had long gone. But um, super funny. She has a terrific podcast called Who's Your God? Please welcome your friend and mine, Amy Miller, ladies and gentlemen. This is the sound of my voice. Now, Amy, you're from Oakland, California. Yes, I grew up in the East Bay. Where did you grow up in Oakland? Um, for much of it. Yeah. As a, as a little, little kid, I was in a town called El Sobrani in the East Bay. Uh, I, I don't know that one. The people never do, which is why I often don't mention it. El, so where's El Sobrani? Is that like, um, it's sort of out by the San Pablo reservoir. Like, uh, it's, it borders Richmond. So okay. Right, okay. Keep, okay. So yeah. you're nor- North, North, keep going East on not 80. Down, not like yeah. down Hayward. Right, Pleasant, yeah. Pleasanton. If you cross over the Bay Bridge and just keep going for about 10 more minutes, you'll hit Richmond and El Sobrani. Right. Um, You're up by the 24 there, are you not? San Rafael Yeah, Bridge? yeah, that was kind of on the other side of us. I but know then that area I, like the goddamn back of my hand. <laughs> I know, me Cle- too. Clearly I don't. I've never heard of where you're from. <laughs> I was just up there and for a few days to kind of celebrating my birthday, and I was realizing that I never used GPS. I think that's the true marker of what your home is, like... If you've moved around a lot, but wherever you go that you don't need a map, um, yeah, I think true. that's that's home. Um, so, then, but then I went <laughs> to funny. I went to Berkeley for college, and then I ended up living in Oakland for you know most of my life until until so you I went all the way. So when it came time to leave for college, you went all the way to Cal Berkeley. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I was lucky to get in. I don't, I was the first person. That's a in great my, school. Yeah. No, my daughter applied. <laughs> Yeah, no one in my family had been to college before, so same, uh, same here, same here. <laughs> I did something, I guess, that felt manageable, but also a big stretch. <laughs> it went okay. So, did I want to get into your podcast? Is called "Who's Your God?" Yes. Now, clearly, you you went to Berkeley, so you're you're a brainiac, uh, and yet you became a comedian. So I've lost all form of respect for you. <laughs> but did you study theology at Berkeley? I did a little bit when I was at Berkeley. I was a sociology major, and I did very... A <laughs> sociology did... <laughs> major at Berkeley. I That's mean, perfect. Or as they call it, nose to the grindstone. <laughs> it's funny because... It's just not just sounds... sociology majors when you get out in the world. There's also <laughs> theology and philosophy majors. It's going right. to be tough out there. I was on a path to become a social worker, and it, I do sound like a Bay Area cliche, but the catch is that I was extremely religious. I was a very strict fundamentalist Baptist going into Berkeley uh, and my whole, my whole childhood, which that's hard to do. And that's why I have a religion podcast. (laughs) It's hard to be. That's uh, funny because Gray Delisle, uh, who was on the last episode also was, I believe raised a a Baptist or or some such. Uh, And uh, I I find that very, uh, very, it, it doesn't surprise me that you go into something that uh, is so deregulated uh, <laughs> performing, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's not what one would think. Uh, yes. It's uh and it's, it's also it goes to show. So how far are you from San Francisco where you, when you grew up 30 minutes, including like bridge time? Oh yeah. Yeah. Maybe 20. Yeah. 20, 25 yeah. minutes. And yet you're a devout Baptist, probably in a town full of them. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And no. <laughs> you, but it, the, the point is like you get right outside the city and you like, cause when people would think like, okay, you grew up in Oakland in the Bay area in, in the East Bay, mm-hmm. then you went to Berkeley, then you moved to Portland yes. and then you moved to Los Angeles. So someone would say, oh, well, you don't even know what it's like to be in America then do you? <laughs> but, but actually you do because the Bay, it doesn't matter. 25 minutes out of the city, you could be anywhere. Yes. Many parts of the East Bay are the Midwest in yeah. some ways, except that we always did for the most part, not out like in, you know, in like Walnut Creek or whatever, like Lori Kilmartin land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's a Lord little Kilmartin fancier, land. you know it's what pronounced, I mean? It's pronounced Kilmartinland. <laughs> 
Lorica Martinland is, you know, upscale strip mall. Do you know what I mean? But it's sure. But well, the Walnut Creek only- Punchline, uh, the Walnut Creek Punchline, where I cut my teeth, is now, I believe, a mattress superstore as well. It should be. <laughs> But in the in El Sobrani, Richmond, you know, I mean, they're working class neighborhoods, and a lot Absolutely. of uh, Absolutely. a lot of our neighbors worked in factories and all the refineries that are kind of you know like out by the Carquinez Bridge. And uh, I came from my dad worked in steel uh, out in Alameda, and so yeah, really? there are all these little churches, little neighborhood churches that can exist and be very fundamentalist. Christian in the middle of the East Bay. And although we don't, you know, it's uncommon. Uh, it, it's also, it was also a very diverse church. So I'm like growing up around many different kinds of people, but then still somehow having the biblical belief of a young Southern gal. <laughs> wow. What is, what defines, you're not a Southern Baptist. Should, we were free East will Bay Baptist. Baptist. Yeah. Free, free will Baptist. It is very, rare uh it is super conservative and yeah what what are you known as within the baptists you're like the sexy baptists <laughs> i the, mean yeah. <laughs> southern baptists and and other kinds of m- more mainstream baptists don't even really know about free will baptists it's very much uh i mean it's an oaky church like they exist in oklahoma and the central valley and then there's a couple in the bay area uh-huh. and that's pretty much it um and it is a lot there are a lot of oklahoma ties which my family's all, you know, Dust Bowl Okies. Um, although this church, my parents didn't go to church. We, it's a story you can hear on my own podcast about uh-huh. how I made myself Christian without anyone influencing me. <laughs> I was raised Catholic. I was raised uh, Irish Catholic, so or Roman Catholic. So I can see that you seem uh, like you feel guilty. I do <laughs> all the time. <laughs> but what differs? Your religious outlook, you know, went back when we were both practicing. How did our outlooks differ? I only know what I was so, taught, which was that from the chin down, it was all filth. <laughs> so free will Baptists, of course, they emphasize free will. And uh, part of the reason they emphasize that you can, you know, remind you that you can make your own choices is because you can actually fall out of favor with God. So at some point, there can be a time when you have sinned enough that you cannot go to a confessional, you cannot pray for forgiveness, you cannot get re-saved. You are just done, and God is done with you, which is really terrifying. God's a a mean girl. (laughs) God is a mean girl, and there's nothing scarier to a kid than a faceless father figure when your own who can who can send you to hell when your own father figure is also kind of scary by the way <laughs> um, um, and then there are some there are some arguments over very specific things in the book of revelations between like free will baptists and southern baptists and other kinds of evangelical christians uh-huh. um, around you know the rapture will will christians live out, uh, you know, the apocalypse on earth, will they be raptured immediately? Like all these sort of nitpicky things about the end times schedule. <laughs> like right. Get- yeah. There's a, there's a lot about, <laughs> there's a lot about the end times. It It is like a wedding. It's like, there's a lot of moving parts, people to seat. <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't invite them to the reception. They're only ceremony friends. <laughs> yeah. There's, it's true. It's true. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the rehearsal dinner for the end times is, yeah, is going to be a big shebang. Now, what is, so is Kirk Cameron, is he also a Baptist? What's he? I, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I'm not really sure. Um, I, I, you know, whatever, I mean, what he is is batshit crazy. But, <laughs> yeah. I think I, he comes a little bit more, well, something about Free Will Baptist is that there is not one mega church amongst any of them. Uh, right. You know, it's it's like a pretty poor arm of the Baptist church. Um, our church was not extravagant. I think it was very nice. You know, it was the 80s, so we had red velvet carpet. Uh, uh-huh. Wow. And big, shul- <laughs> um, <laughs> big shoulder pads. <laughs> yes. Modified, uh, you had a modified mullet. And, uh, so yeah. I think of Kirk Cameron as more from that kind of megachurch evangelical world, but I could be wrong. They all kind of run together at this point because it's just a for-profit business now. So it's no, like- it, re- it really is, and I wonder. I really wonder how much, how much of the grift do they acknowledge to themselves? 
you know, and, and, and we'll never know, you know, I, my mother, when I was a kid, my mother was, uh, heavily devoted to Oral Roberts, the, mm -hmm. uh, televangelist, uh, and later his brother, Anal Roberts. <laughs> I often wonder, and then later in life, uh, you know, Oral said that, uh, you know, basically God said that he had like, he had to raise $2,000 in a week or he was going to kill him. There's like some <laughs> weird thing, like Oral had a balloon payment due or some such. But I always wonder how aware of the fact that he was, that it was a grift did Oral believe? You know, people talk about like, you know, I am sure Donald Trump believes everything he says. I'm sure mm -hmm. that he fully creates his own reality in his head. Yeah. I think um, there's a mix of people who don't acknowledge the grift because that would peel away the curtain and people who truly believe, but also the, you know, this prosperity gospel thing is like, which was the George W. Bush thing. Yeah. I mean, a lot was of it, these, uh, the book of talents, is that it? Mm, I'm not sure. Well, there's a thing in the Bible purportedly called the Book of Talents. Yes, yes. Which which ties to the prosperity gospel, which is, uh, 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 hey, as much money as you can make, go nuts. Just proves how awesome you are to God. Yes, as long as you're devoted to God. And in theory, you use some of that money for good, although that seems to be less and less a part of the evangelical sure. church. Right. Um, by the way, my upstairs neighbor just started taking a shower. So if you can oh, hear that. I'm glad you went hour at the end of that <laughs> phrase because I thought it was going somewhere else. If that's um, too loud, let me know. Can, and I, I, can, can, I can't hear it. Move around. But I'm okay. imagining it now. <laughs> pretty great. <laughs> but I think also like, yeah, I mean, at some point you have to fully believe the grift so that you can keep getting money from people. You know, there's a mega church in L.A. that my podcast co-host. Well, there are many, but. Uh, on the outskirts uh, in Covina that my podcast co-host used to be um, a pastor in before he left the church. And they have recently sold their property, you know, he thinks, to Amazon. And so they're moving their church. And the whole messaging around this is God has blessed us. You know, God has decided that we are the most holy church. And so he sent Amazon along to give us, you know, sure, $20 million. Right. Anything, anything you do is proof that, uh, yeah, that, well, that makes perfect sense. And, and the that's congregation all people... doesn't stop tithing. I mean, that's the really wild part to me. It's almost like the parallel in comedy is like, you know, giving to the <laughs> working class people, giving to the Patreon of a multi multi millionaire comedians so that you know it's like it's so strange you know just to be a part of that uh, yeah and i guess it's too, I, you see it today and you see it on the you know you see it on the far right and on the far left that there are these grifts yeah and they're grievance based yes uh, you're the victim and i'm going to i'm going to keep you angry but i'm going to fight for you because you're the victim. People love a contrarian. Uh, yeah. yeah. Especially if they feel unseen. I mean. Yeah. And, and, and the ultimate, especially un unfortunately, when it comes to uh, uh, a lot of these on the uh, far left, they're uh, run by failed comedians. And it's that the, 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 the true victim of American culture, the white male, you know, <laughs> exactly. if there's anybody, if there's anybody who needs to be heard, and, I, just, I love the story of how someone was shut out from making it in comedy because of their viewpoints, which, uh, <laughs> which, okay, I can relate to that a little bit, but a lot of the well, times people are saying this who are not good at it. And it's yeah. like, oh, well, did usually, you consider that you're not funny? Yeah, that's, yeah, there's only one way to fall out. Of, there's only one way to flunk out of comedy, and I think you pulled it off. And, and there's also, you know, and they also talk about how they've been muzzled, you know, and you can hear about how I've been muzzled on my podcast, my Twitter feed, my face. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, my new Netflix special. Yeah, yeah I, you know. <laughs> It's everywhere I look, I have to listen to you talk about the fact that people are muzzling you. Um, well, it's, I mean, that is the tie between kind of, it, it's interesting that I went into comedy because I'm kind of always on my guard because I know that I'm susceptible to buying into a belief system that takes over my whole life. So, so I'm always kind of, you know, now I have my ears perked up a little bit. I mean, I'm sort of suspicious of, of everyone that thinks that they know exactly what is right. Cause I've already lived that life for so long, you know, sure. that I listen to pastors and 
believed in in the Bible 100%, you know. So I'm always like, I don't know. I'm just suspicious of you if you think you've got the answers. Sure, that was always my, you know, that was always my attitude towards anything uh, theological was all I know is I know I don't know. And anybody who says they know is lying. Um, and, and, and that, that goes to atheism as well. It's like, you know, a, a devout atheist is just as full of baloney as a devout Christian. It's like, oh, so <laughs> yes. you absolutely, so, so I'm a fool for thinking I know what happens after I die, but you're smart because you know what happens after you die. So yeah, I, I've never, since I left the church and to some extent, some of the years I was still in it, I have never understood anyone who lives a life that involves thinking I guy 100% know what the truth is about anything. It's, it's very strange to me. And it is, you know, uh, largely, I think often, a, a white people disease and a white male disease, but Boy, I take your point that he, that he's shitting on this guy for his belief system, which is always, which is always a uh, dangerous ground. I, I understand the motivation in that people use their purported closeness to God as an excuse for great ill, for great evil. Yes. Um, and, uh, to and, God and to that or... end, uh, to that end, I, I, I think is the motivation for a lot of, a lot of that. But I, I take your point. And closeness to God or whatever, closeness to intellectualism or politics Absolutely. or whatever, the, or comedy, the thing that you... Yeah, you feel like you know the most about. I mean, it's, you know, or or teaching your kid how to use a can opener. <laughs> 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 I mean, that was a situation. I read, I think his apology was really good. Now we're talking about Bean Dad, which is hilarious. Right. But uh, I think his apology was really good. But But in the moment, it's like, how do you feel like you 100% know that this all sounds healthy and normal when thousands of people are telling you it does not sound healthy and normal? You know, you have to, it's just, a, it's just now, a for world the, for I the don't sake understand. Of the, for the sake of the people that, that don't follow Twitter, give us a breakdown of Bean Dad, just so we know it. So I, know it I know it involves Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this guy, he, he, well, he has a podcast with Ken Jennings. I've actually followed this man for years because I really like his band, The Long Winters. And I think we crossed paths a couple times in the mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest. Um, and, you know, he just, he wanted to write something. It was also, you could tell it was one of those nights where he wanted, you, sometimes you have a Twitter thread inside of you. You know, Dana, those nights when you're like, Oh, this is going to be a great story, and people are going to. You, really you don't like have it. three kids. <laughs> <laughs> I never have a Twitter thread inside. <laughs> well, that's good. You're probably better off. But you know, he wanted to write this sort of sensationalist story about teaching his daughter how to use an old school can opener, and then it came off sounding like he was starving his daughter, and also, you know, just right. being kind of a know-it-all dad who was teaching sure. in a really strange way, and he was so he grew so defend, and it was a can of beans. Uh, Right. So defensive to everyone saying, like, I mean, at least get her a snack. And then this is taking six hours to learn the can opener. <laughs> um, oh, and he, oh, he wouldn't let her eat until she'd open the can opener. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and she's and the, she started the story hungry. He says that. And she <laughs> and he says there were tears. You know, she cried, but he really felt like he taught her a lesson. And I think now he's kind of seen, you know, sometimes it's hard to see through the Twitter mob and know who's really saying reasonable things about my behavior and, and what, what part of it is just a mob, I guess. Uh, True. Yeah. Well, the very... important, th yeah, it's also important to remember that <clears throat> when you, when you get off Twitter the, and you leave your house, the real world has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really true. It's really true. Like I, I I'm alarmed at things that are like just the biggest brouhaha. And then you go out into the world and nobody has a, it, it is, it's like a little spaceship that orbits the planet. It's not a part of the planet at all. <laughs> you know, it's Absolutely. There's not a lot of room for nuance. And when you're talking about serious things, and now when you say something that's just silly, then people are looking for serious nuance where it shouldn't exist because it's just a joke. And then, oh yeah, exactly. You know. And and it's and it's the you know they used to say that death is other people. You know that uh, whatever the expression is, uh, hell is other people. Yeah. Uh, you know because there is a comments. You don't, you don't have to make one. 
This is why, in fact, I love Catholic men because you guys are always sorry. And at no point are you ever, you know, in a situation where a lot of people are yelling at you that you're wrong, standing your ground. I mean, immediately you'll yeah, back double, down. Yeah, there's no double down in the Catholic Church. <laughs> And I love that. I mean, I think uh, my friend Marsha Belsky I, I used to have a joke about loving Catholic men because they're the only men that understand a little bit what it's like to be women because you're just sorry to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to have a I used to have a joke. This is a hundred years old, but like, I, you know, being married is just like this. Back when I was married, it's like I just wake up first thing in the morning. I'm sorry. Just get one on the board. <laughs> hit the yeah. ground running. Hit the ground running. Yeah. yeah, so it's very foreign to me anytime a person, a man, anybody is like, you know, being told like, hey, this might be out of line and then just doubles down and is well, and it's, and now convinced it's cul- they're right. Yeah, well, it's also cultural now because we have a have had a child, an emotional child in the leading our culture for four years that now, uh, you know, it's a sign of masculinity to never admit you're wrong when in fact when in fact think you know a good 10 second think would show you that it's the reverse (laughs) you know no i'm secure enough that i can freely admit when i've made a mistake learn from it and go on it's not a big deal yeah (laughs) um and 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 that sort of brings us brings us back to what we were talking about before in terms of like, you know, the, 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 the grifts and, and, and there are, there are so many and that that's a part of white male, you know, grievances that, you know, it's, we've been made, you know, we have to apologize for everything. We have to apologize for, so now they apologize for nothing. Well, mm-hmm. great. Congratulations. You're six. <laughs> Yeah, you're six and now you have this strong man daddy who will never back down on your behalf while you sort of live your life where you probably have to back down all the time because that's how regular life works. If you're just a, you know, a working person with a family, you don't get to double down all day long. So it's nice to have people you can look up to, <laughs> you know, the president and right wing comedians or whatever to say like, well, he's doing it for me. So I'll just continue to be probably a normal nice guy just doing my job and taking care of my kids but you know this guy doesn't give a fuck (laughs) yeah i mean it's i wonder you know go back you know go back hundreds of years so you know the 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 rise of of of, you know the these giant church corporations that wasn't so much grievances it was out and out control and and my my again I'm quoting my friend Kevin Rooney it's like Kevin Rooney said like how shitty does the world have to be to come up with catholicism it's like you know when things get great when you're dead and then it gets really good well, can i do anything to make it better now no 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 don't even bother no just <laughs> just wait when you're dead it's great <laughs> like, in fact how, in how fact, bad do things have to be yeah on top of it, don't do many of the, the things that do bring you joy while you're on this earth because those are sins so yeah, yeah exactly yeah like, and but again and it's all about that's all about control and it really was government at the time it was that was how people were controlled and and it's effective and i've been in it so i you know i'm very skeptical of everything now they're true to The public wants what the public gets. But I don't get what this society wants. I'm going underground. That's Paul Weller from the jams Going Underground, released in March of 1980. Oh, man. If only he knew what was coming. Now, it's a common fantasy. Just walking away from society, leaving it all behind, going off the grid and disappearing from the world. In 2002, 
Neil LeBute wrote a play called The Mercy Seat about a man who worked at the World Trade Center but happened to not be there during the attack but contemplated using the attack as a cover to disappear and start a new life. Now, it's easier said than done, yeah? Especially with cell phones. Am I right? By the way, just a side note, but this drives me crazy. All the ding-dongs out there that don't want to get vaccinated because they think the government is going to microchip them and track their movements... All of these people walk around with cell phones, allowing anybody to track their movements. Not to mention the fact that the one time they actually did something against the government, they posted it on goddamn Facebook. Idiots. Believe me, as of late, I have been thinking about the jams going underground quite a bit. What would it be like to just walk away? The following story was taken from a number of sources, predominantly from Michael Finkel's stories in The Guardian and in Gentleman's Quarterly. Christopher Knight, not the guy who played Peter Brady, another Christopher Knight. This Christopher Knight is 20 years old. And he worked in Boston installing alarm systems in houses and in cars. Um, I'm not sure if he was a fan of the jam or if he had ever even heard the song going underground. But one day, he gave his boss notice, cashed his last paycheck, and split town. As one does, he just drove. He drove his car and listened to the radio and stopped when he got tired and stayed in cheap motels. And then he got up and started driving again. 20 years old, in a car, listening to the radio, driving. And he drove and he drove and he drove all the way down the East Coast until he found himself in Florida. This was the spring of 1986 and the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown had just occurred. The number one song in the country was Dionne Warwick's That's What Friends Are For. But Chris Knight didn't have any friends, not in Florida anyway. So he turned his ass around and drove back up north. He drove and he drove and he drove. He didn't talk to anybody. He didn't call anybody. His family didn't know where he was. He was just driving. He drove back north towards Boston, then past Boston and up into Maine, where he was from. In fact, he drove right by his parents' house. But he didn't stop. He didn't call. He just kept driving. He drove to Moosehead Lake. He was running out of gas now. But instead of turning back around to get some, he kept going off the main road onto an access road then onto a dirt road, then onto a trail. Now, Chris had no plan. He wasn't prepared for anything. He had a tent and a backpack in the car by chance. So he grabbed them, threw the keys on the dashboard, and walked into the woods. Now, Henry David Thoreau walked away from society into the wilds of Walden Pond, to embark on a journey within himself, to explore, as Thoreau wrote, the private sea, the Atlantic and Pacific of one's being. Long before Thoreau, in the 6th century BC, Chinese philosopher Lao Chi wrote the Tao Te Ching, which told the tale of how he, Lao Chi, removed himself to the wilderness to protest the corrupt state of society. Lao Chi claimed that withdrawing from culture helped him acquire wisdom. That it wasn't pursuit, it was retreat. 
Chris Knight drove up from Florida. And as he said many years later, I, I can't explain my actions. I had no plans when I left. I wasn't thinking of anything. I just did it. He wandered through the woods for weeks. Wandering aimlessly, but very contentedly, through the woods and the wetlands. Except, of course, he was hungry. He found a dead partridge, but he had no means to start a fire. So he ate it raw, and miraculously did not get sick. This wandering through the woods lasted for months. But eventually, with winter approaching, Knight decided he needed a more permanent redoubt, eventually settling on a small area about the size of a bedroom, hidden so well behind an outcropping of rocks that it was basically invisible even when you were right in front of it. Not that there was anyone to hide from so far out in the woods in Maine, but this became Chris's home. Chris was now officially a hermit, and he had really only two concerns in life, food and surviving the winter. For the former, it became necessary for Chris, despite his best intentions and strong moral code, to steal. Now, Maine, for those of you who don't know, is known as the Vacation State. And it is dotted with lakes, and sprinkled around these lakes are summer and weekend cabins, each offering a variety of necessity items if you happen to be a non-magical hermit living in the nearby woods. And so began the legend of the Hungry Man. Chris hated having to steal. And there was a pit of tension in his stomach every time he did it. But he had to stay alive. There were approximately a hundred cabins scattered around his area from which he could steal. And he watched them closely, figuring out the migration patterns of their owners. Chris had long ago lost track of what day it was, or month, or year. But he could sense the weekend from the amount of noise floating in from across the lake. Weekends meant people, and people meant lay low. The best time to steal was during the week, between 2 and 4 a.m., preferably when it was raining. Chris had set up a little propane stove in his camp, and so stealing propane became a necessity. But those tanks are hard to carry. In these cases, he would borrow a canoe from one cabin steal propane from another. He would swap out his empty tank for a full tank, then return the canoe and sprinkle pine needles on it to make it look untouched. In a perfect world, the cabin owners didn't even know he'd been there. But he couldn't always cover his tracks so thoroughly, and so he became known in the area as the Hungry Man, the mysterious hermit in the woods who would break into your cabin and steal your food. Now, some people were charmed by it and left him notes or asked him to leave them a shopping list of things he needed. He never replied. As he said many years later, every time I was very conscious that I was doing wrong, I took no pleasure in it at all. For the record, his diet sucked. An examination of his buried trash near his encampment revealed an empty five-pound tub of marshmallow fluff. I want devil dog wrappers, peanut butter, totally defensible staple item, Cheetos, Cool Whip, tater tots, pudding. But as Chris explained, he had two concerns. Preparing for winter, which acquired putting on weight. Although, you pay for that with your teeth, and Chris's teeth were for shit, and always hurt. His other job was surviving the winter. Winter in the Maine woods. Now, one would think that the best way to survive winter would be to just try and sleep through it, like a bear. But apparently not. According to Chris, and he would know, it's dangerous to sleep 
too long in the winter. During the dead cold of Maine's winter, it can get down to 20 below. Chris would sleep from 7.30 at night to 2 in the morning when it would be coldest. That way, said Chris, in the depth of the cold, I would be awake. The fear being that were he to sleep through that period, the condensation from his body might freeze his sleeping bag. So he would have to wake up at 2 in the morning, light his propane stove, and start melting snow so he would have his water supply for the day. Then he would walk around to maintain his circulation. Walking around the main woods at 3 in the morning in the dead of winter every night. And this would go on night after night until he heard the chickadees. And then he knew that spring was on its way. He had survived and would be filled with a sense of deep peace. One night, as summer was turning to fall, and Chris's winter preparation was in full swing, he hiked about an hour away from his encampment to the Pine Tree Summer Camp and headed for the kitchen. He snuck in pretty easy on a previous raid he had stolen, among other things, a key, and he began to load up on supplies. Now remember, Chris's job before he moved to the woods was installing alarm systems. But that was a while ago, and technology had improved. And as Chris made his way out of the kitchen of the Pine Tree Summer Camp, he came face to face with a man holding a flashlight in one hand and a three fifty seven Magnum in the other. The police arrived shortly thereafter. The hungry man had been caught. Chris was handcuffed, and asked several questions. He had no ID, but he gave them his name. When they asked him where he lived, he said, The woods. For how long? Chris paused, thought about it, and then asked, quite innocently, when the Chernobyl nuclear plant disaster had occurred. It was 2013. Chernobyl was 27 years ago. Christopher Knight had been living in the woods for nearly three decades. He was charged with burglary and transported to the Kennebec County Jail. By the time the other reported and provable burglaries were added to Chris's charge, he was looking at up to a dozen years in prison. But the judge ordered a sentence of only seven months. He had already served all but one week. He was released with strict provisions. He had to meet with the judge once a week, no alcohol, and he had to either get a job or go to school. In the meantime, he had returned home and was living with his mother. So, you know, prisoner, go back and live with your mother. I don't know your world, Chris told reporter Michael Finkel, whose work I am relating. Only my world. And memories of the world before I went into the woods. What is life today? What is proper? I have to figure out how to live. And then he added, I miss the woods. While Chris was in jail, he finally was given an extensive medical examination. One thing that was revealed was that he had Asperger's syndrome. He took the diagnosis in stride. As he said, I don't think I'll be spokesman for the Asperger's telethon. Do they still have telethons? And then he added, importing the wisdom that he learned, a wisdom akin to that of Lao Che. I hate Jerry Lewis. So how did you end up leaving? uh, How deep into your college education did being a Baptist last? It was quite a process because for a while I wasn't going to church and I was kind of starting to dabble in some very normal college activities like, sure. oh, drinking a beer. Wow. Seeing a rated R movie <laughs> and feeling guilty about oh, it. I, I, I was like, college, normal college activities like Star Trek next gen cosplay. <laughs> yeah. Just normal college activities. Yeah. You were cool. <laughs> Booking an open mic. <laughs> Um, I, the guilt lasted a long time. And for a long time, I had really, really gnarly kind of like apocalypse dreams. Um, Really? 
<laughs> yeah, but I think do tell. Well, um, yeah, I guess if you do grow up thinking that the world is going to end and it's going to end on your watch, that's the other amazing thing about it's the, the narcissism of that, that the world that's been here, even if you think the world has only been here for 500 years, that it's going to end while you're here. Yes. Well, you can always find signs of the times if you're looking. I mean, every generation has had all the markers of, you know, the signs from Revelation. So, and then, you know, in my generation, I also had, you know, the Y2K threat in my head as a young teenager. So, or, you know, I mean, I guess I was 16 and, um, and we made it through that. So that was the start of my suspicions because I, but yeah, there's this message that Jesus will come. The Bible says like a thief in the night. So he's going to return you know, you could be doing anything. I am, could be jerking off. I could be watching a rated R movie. I could be listening to R and B for God's sakes. Um, and so you have to stay vigilant and, you know, be afraid all the time and make sure yeah. he doesn't come back right when you're doing something that is fun, but sinful. So, sure, sure. so it took me a few years to not have those dreams. I would wake up in the middle of the night and think that, you know, it doesn't like hold, it doesn't hold up to cross examination. <laughs> No, it falls apart on cross. I've always had sleep issues anyway, and a lot of it is anxiety. But I, I, I would hear, think I, that I hear you. I hear you know, you. like a, a loud train going by was it? Like that was the rumble. Um, and also, you know, I spent a lot. So of So really, time- you would hear a train go by your house in middle school or high school, and it would trigger anxiety in you that of the end of the world. Absolutely, yes, mm-hmm. and and keep in mind that I lived. On the coast and in, in the book I know. Of God forbid you get an earthquake. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another thing. Yeah. And no, I remember when I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I was w- very weird about earthquakes. And uh, there was, a, you know, in the, I'm talking like 90, 91. I remember like we had a go at like a 5, 8. And then for the next, you know, year, every time a moth would fart, I'd jump out of bed. You know, it's just like... <laughs> There, it's like, well, it's the worst yes. thing that could happen. That thing that happened, you know. I know. I love <laughs> it to makes watch. Some noise. A, I love to watch earthquake Twitter from people who just moved here and have only been through like the three point twos and whatever. It's like it's really not that funny when you're in, you know, Loma Prieta. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. When terrifying. you're really catching it, yeah. When you're really <laughs> catching it, yeah. So I live, you know, on on the bay. So in the Book of Revelation, you know the the beast that comes out of the water signaling the apocalypse. So I'm like, well, this is fucking great. So we'll be the first to see the beast because I live on the West Coast. This is the logic that I had as a child. And so I thought, you know, he was coming straight for me first. And, sure, of course. and then, you know, in, in Nebraska, your apocalypse happens a couple hours later, I guess, in that scenario. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but anyways, you know, it's coming. You know, it's coming. <laughs> So yeah. it's good to, to get a, you get a leg up. Exactly. So I always thought it was happening, but now I know a lot of that was probably generalized anxiety and trauma. <laughs> sure. Are your parents still Baptists? So they never were. And that's a weird part of the story. She, eh, what? <laughs> yeah. I feel good. That's where in the, in the, in the movie theater trailer for this conversation, that's the needle scratch. Are your parents still Baptists? They never were. Eh, I feel good. Doodle, 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 doodle. That was every 90s movie trailer. Yeah, my sister and I just, I have three siblings, but one sister and I kind of sought out the church as, I think, you know, a way to have adults that cared about us. Our parents didn't go to church. They were mostly not home when we were kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and did, our they have, was- did they have issues metabolizing alcohol? Oh, yes. Well, no, they mm-hmm. metabolized it very well. Right. <laughs> Suck it right down all yeah. day long. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar. <laughs> so the house was very chaotic, and I think when uh-huh. we had the option to go to this church, yeah, and you walk seek away, you seek or you seek order. Yeah, uh, there were other kids there, and we could go to camp, and we could go to youth group, and all this stuff. And so the church right. kind of recruited us, as they oh, would recruit okay. many this neglected is very children. Now. Yeah, so my mom's a little bit religious now, in the way of um, old conservatives, how they turn Christian eventually. Um, but no, never when I was a kid, nobody, just me and my sister. And how old is it? Older, younger? 
two years older. Yeah. So when we were little when we started going, like, I mean, I'm truly like, you know, four and six years old or something. Wow. And how did you get there at that age? Well, they bring around a van, Dana, and they tell your parents, we'll take your kids on Sunday morning to this place and drop them back off when we're done. And And my dad said that is when football is on. So this works great for me. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Wow. Of course you became a comic. (laughs) Well, that was all a really big surprise, too. (laughs) Still is. That's interesting. I, it's so funny. I had a s- similar yet different experience. And uh, you know, finding up. religion on your own. Never, never was religious. No, but did uh, was an altar boy and a lector at the at a Catholic church because it was uh, th- there was a structure to it, and like my friends did it, and it was a way to get out of the house and a way to go do stuff, and it was social. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it makes sense in some ways, you know, and when you're in the church, when, you know, you're, of course, always supposed to testify to people and try to recruit new members. I mean, they kind of tell you to look at your friends who are kind of neglected. Look at your friends who have alcoholic parents. Look at your friends who have chaotic home lives because they will like the structure. But also it provides this explanation that is really easy, like, oh, your your home life is unhappy because your parents are sinners and they're lost and you know the things they do are sinful and so it kind of made sense in a lot of ways like we were like oh okay so they need jesus and then everything would be okay so then we got into the business of trying to save our parents as very small children (laughs) what a terrible plan (laughs) and my dad did pass away when i was young i was only nine and and you uh, felt you did it with your healing power (laughs) No, but uh, one of our youth pastors was very quick to come by the house and let us know that he was most likely in hell. So that was nice. <laughs> oh, great. Because we had not succeeded at uh, at introducing him to Christ while he was still alive. How old was this person? I mean, he was probably in his mid-30s. He's now in prison for many counts of child molestation. So. Okay, that, again, boy, tell me something that's surprising. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this was, this, uh, I mean, this goes to my skepticism, too. I mean, that man was the source of so much of my guilt as a kid. Uh, thankfully, he did not abuse me. I don't know. I mean, I thought I was pretty cute. Not a good joke. Um, <laughs> I've had a different version of the same joke. <laughs> Mine was... I was an altar boy in the Boston Archdiocese in the uh, 1980s. Nobody laid a finger on me. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. But he was good at making me feel guilty and like I was never truly saved and I was never on a righteous path, so... No coincidence that he was up to no good. Yeah, and it's uh, it is funny though. And again, I think I think this is a, a uh, this is a part of religious that you probably agreed with. Was I? Uh, I think it's Bill's joke. Like, yeah, get a lot of men together in a place where women aren't allowed, and wait for the hideousness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now at this point in my life, if anyone's, you know, extremely self-righteous or has very strong opinions about how I should behave, I, I have questions, I'll say. Sure. And, and I think that, you know, when you look at, you, know, you talk about the Twitter world and things like, you know, people that are f- really into Trumpism or really, really, like the, the, whatever their political agenda is, is their whole life that's just a different form of religious zealotry. It's all the same thing. It's that the world is not right. You have to do what I believe in, and that's the only way the world can get right. If you don't agree with what I believe in, then you're the problem with the world. It's it's the same thing. Yes. And it's, I guess the frustrating thing is, and, and I guess there's no more of it than there ever was. We just see more of it. You know, it's like, you know, we don't have more cockroaches. I just have a better flashlight sort of thing. But how how have we come this far and yet this hasn't changed? I know. I know. It's interesting. I I had this kind of battle with my mom recently. We don't talk about politics often for this reason, but... That's good, though, that you 
that you hold to that. I want her in my life because I only have one parent and no grandparents. So like, you yeah, know, no, it's better, fine. I, 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 I have the same deal. And, uh, it, it, we, I'm like that with my entire family and, uh, everybody hangs on to it pretty good. Yeah. And I, and I love her so much and she is very, you know, she has a very generous spirit, but she also just watches a lot of Fox news and for yeah, whatever people, reason, we, there's an uh, entire generation of people who have lost their parents to Fox News. <laughs> it's really, it's really true. No, it's really true. I think that somebody is doing a documentary about it. Well, I just hope she doesn't jump to Newsmax or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that'll she be. Will. Then we'll have to talk about if we can still be friends. But but uh, we got kind of in a fight because she really, really wanted to defend Rush Limbaugh of all people. And although Jesus. I didn't want to go down that road, it was interesting how much you know someone like my mom does think like, yes, she thinks she is 100% right. Rush Limbaugh is 100% right. And if you believe anything different, you're wrong. But also that there's one other side. And I'm like, what do you think, quote unquote, my side is? Because it's not like, I don't know that I've ever voted in my lifetime for someone that I loved all of the things they believe. You know what sure, I mean? Yeah, yeah, Everyone's yeah, totally. a compromise. I don't like Nancy Pelosi. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but well, that, that gets into the, <laughs> but that gets into the religious fervor that it's, that it's perfection or nothing because it's, because it's no longer just what's the best way to get stamps affordable or, or what have you. Now it's, it's good and evil. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, yes. And I and I tried to explain to her, like my side from my perspective is that I know a lot of people that would not speak to you anymore if you were their mom. So is that where you want me to go? Like, I, you know, I'm closer to being a socialist and friends with socialists. But like that probably horrifies you. You know, that's very scary. So, like, right. you know, if you want to believe in your mind, like, you know, my daughter's stupid for being a Democrat or whatever, like. That's sure. fine. But there are layers to this thing. It's not exactly two sides. And also, you know, keep in mind in my regular life, most of the past 10 years, I've performed for a lot of people that don't agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and had a very nice time. You know, I had jokes about Reagan and jokes about Clinton and it wouldn't cause a riot and you wouldn't get walkouts. Right. You know? People wouldn't throw beers at you because you made a joke about the news. Yeah. Um, and it's because the the president, unfortunately, inflicts his psyche on the country. And our current president is insane. <laughs> and so the country's gone insane. Yeah. And there are more people that are zealots. And I would say it's still a very small minority. But when you it's like what you're saying about Twitter not being real life. When you have like that one guy or that one person at the show who wants to throw something at you because you said something about Trump, you're like, wait, you're being Twitter. But in real life, this is not we have yeah. a contract here. Like this is supposed to be a fun event. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, we're all together. You bought a ticket. You could have researched who I was and my viewpoint. I uh, had a guy. I had a guy come up to me after a show and said, "Hey, unblock me!" And I was like, "What are you talking about?" He goes, "You blocked me on Twitter. Unblock me." <laughs> yeah, and remember? Like, David? <laughs> I've only blocked like a couple people, and it had to be if you said something really vile. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. I don't block you if I don't agree with you. I might mute you so I don't have to deal with you, but I'm promo I'm usually on Twitter to promote shit. I want as many I want as much money as I can get. So if you if I blocked you, you said something racist probably. Yeah. And 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 this to this guy it's just it's just sports. It's hey unblock me. And to this guy yeah. it's just Well I'm it, sure you know. he said something ironically racist in his mind or you know there's always people that yeah just try to tag the joke or make it awful somehow when you didn't make it awful and it's like no i don't want to yeah. see your shit so it's weird when it happens in the real world but it is still really rare and that's what i sort of said to my mom is i'm like mom you live inside your house watching fox news i've been out Hanging out with Trump supporters. I mean, not like, let's go get a beer, but, you know, buy sure. my yeah, merch. Yeah, 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 I get you, yeah. I mean, I just want your 20 bucks for my merch, honestly. Um, but having thoughtful one-on-one -on -one conversations, like, I exist 
in the world. And I know that there are layers to this. I don't think that every person that voted for Trump is, well, okay. I mean, I shouldn't get into this. <laughs> no, go ahead. Just, all right. I'm saying I've had a, a, a pleasant time making some of these people laugh and they yes. have been, you know, reasonable yes. that evening. I think it's hard to justify at this point, not being a racist if you voted for him and still support him now, but you know, yeah, no, my uh, brothers all supported him and I'm sure they all do support him. And my whole take on that is they live in a different reality. They get news from different sources they live in a complete feedback loop of their belief system, mm -hmm. to use uh, John Hodgman's analogy. We see different colored skies. Mm -hmm. I see blue and they see green. And you can tell them it's not green all day long. It's green to them. You know, yes. Uh, so, and there's a huge difference between people who voted four years ago and people today. I mean, especially today. Like yeah. this afternoon, Although I, if you support him, you know, yeah, maybe I'll be, you're not a I'm great interested person. to see. I'm interested to see. I mean, I think maybe I'm too cynical. I think maybe I'm too cynical. Um, I know this shocked a lot of people in the professional class. You know, to these ding-dongs, it's just hillbilly Disneyland. It's just, you know, they flew here. They're excited. They came for the day. They're going to trash Congress, because to them, and it started in the 80s with Reagan saying that government was the problem, and then that became, you know, a fervent belief. And, you know, to them, if they managed to burn down, uh, the, they would have been great. And they would have gone home saying America, tree to save it. They don't see a lot of nuance. And, and no. You know, Reagan is a big source of it. It's like my mom's generation, you know, pe boomers. I mean, she's turned 70 yesterday, actually. I mean, she voted for Trump because of Reagan. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. this is my party. This is what I decided as a young person. And uh, and it was financial at the time and now. But, you know, at this point today, if you're still supporting him, you know, then I have questions about your character. But yeah, if you literally today, January 6th, if you, if you are literally on board after today, January 6th, it's it's a different discussion. You're a zealot. There's, You're truly well, a zealot. Or there's just w a willful need to look away. Yes. You know, I know people that are great and they're smart and they're funny and they get it and they still defend Woody Allen. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Well, even if he didn't do the terrible thing, he, you know, the, the thing that's not contested is gross. <laughs> exactly. You know, he, he dated... He could have slept with any woman on the planet except for his girlfriend's adopted daughter. Or maybe, maybe they were even married by then. I don't know. But it's like, that's like right out of the gate. That's like, no, that's. Not and cool. then made so many of his movies about how it's OK to date a teenager. Yeah. yeah. And then you look really back and you're like, eh, yeah. <laughs> telling yeah. us everything. Yeah. yeah that's that's, yeah, the, that's, the, that's what I mean. It's like. No. Well, this is what was interesting about the Rush Limbaugh fight is I, I'm like, there, there are many good people, of course, in every profession, but a lot of people. I disagree, just, but continue. <laughs> a lot of people are just terrible and flawed. There is almost no one that I, I mean, I said this to my mom. There's almost maybe, maybe if you said a bad word about Dolly Parton, I would turn it into an argument. You know, she's the only person I believe in probably on this planet. A hundred percent. Oh boy, I wish I knew that going in. This is going to get ugly really fast. <laughs> but you're starting a fight. I'm sorry, with... <laughs> do you mean Dolly Antichrist, pardon? Are we talking about the same person? To, to willfully have an argument with your daughter who came to visit you in the middle of a pandemic, got tested, is wearing right. a mask inside your home, shouldn't be there at all. To take that turn to defend Rush Limbaugh is really crazy behavior because... You can't even say, like, this is a nice person. I mean, he's he's very broken as a man. Uh, he no, is, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a monster. He's a monster. He's a monster. To them, it's just like a, a joke. Yes. and But it's not a joke anymore. Yes. And at the time it was, and that sort of like, um, you know, late 80s, early 90s talk radio world, like, I mean, it, in a way it was interesting because you know there's something for everybody but yeah they're all performing and then to turn it into the zealotry so many years later is really strange but you know at the core of it it's like 
you he doesn't care about you mom why are you causing a fight with me to defend this man there's just no there's no man i would go to the mat for to use a wrestling term uh it's just a weird choice to spoil our good time (laughs) just yeah try to convince me this guy's all right and i I, there's going to be some brilliance there's some genius in the fox news model that gets every old person (laughs) falls down that rabbit hole it is strange. So many blonde women just. <laughs> yeah, I, I just know. don't. I don't. I I don't know what it is. But boy, oh boy, do they do they fall down that rabbit hole? And I think a lot and, of it's fear. It's it's comforting in a way, I think. To have an enemy at all times for them. That's and this true. is like in the advertising too. I mean, the commercials on Fox and News alone. And you know, again, you get, there you get into the religion. It's the, that's the religious substitute too, is that, you know, the, the first thing that happens to any, you know, fervent religious movement is we're under attack. You know, Christian Christianity is under attack, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, and, and we see that in comedy a lot. And it's the same thing where, you know, there's there's allegations about somebody and you're like, even if this guy didn't do it, nobody has a nice story about him from 25 years. You know, like he's not a kind person. Right. So most likely the allegations are true because I'm choosing to believe these women or whatever it is. But like, why are you why are you treating this as if we're attacking free speech and comedy as an art form because this guy's an asshole? You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, there's, and there's also, but there's that point of like, you, you tell people they're under attack, they get into a defensive crouch, it becomes tribal, it's us against them. It just becomes a feedback loop. And it, and it works for Fox News. It's, it's really the whole AM shock, shock, grievance shtick. And, and, and yeah, now, and it's, and, and, you know, the lunacy of Christianity being, and here's, you know, here's, the worst offenders now are the people that are in charge. You know, it's like Christianity is under attack. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's so hard to find anything in our culture that's pro-Christian, um, except the the billions of churches dotting the landscape like mushrooms, the pictures of Jesus everywhere. Uh, yeah, our tax law, our yeah. calendar, so right. many things. White, <laughs> men, white men are under attack. Mm, again, last time I looked, we're doing real well. It's still a great way to get people galvanized. Yeah, it's weird, man. I don't. I'm listening to a lot of uh, old episodes of Love Line. <laughs> I'm like, which I'm not proud of, but you on don't, long uh, drive, you know, Amy, Amy, uh, <laughs> you don't get that time back. <laughs> on a long drive. Now, I mean, this is the thing. Is like. Someone like Corolla and I, I don't know if you guys are friends. We have oh, we worked. are friends. We are yeah, friends. I've, I've done a show together. a billion times. I've done a <laughs> but, show a billion times. I mean, even, you know, his belief system in the late 90s on these Love Line episodes is very, I mean, it's all over the map, you know? He's like, no, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I'm, you know, I, I don't talk about Adam on the show because he's so controversial now. Yeah. Yeah. And, now. Yeah. And I know him, I know him too well as a person that I, I don't. I don't pay attention to the public Adam because I know the private Adam. Right. And to me, I just lump him in with my brother, Kevin. I would, you know, I, I, I would rather wrestle snakes than get into a political argument with my brother, Kevin, because he, he, he we have different realities. It's a pointless exercise. Yes. Okay. And it's, well, the same, it's, a, it's the same. It's the same with Adam. However, I also know this. Both guys, if your car was broken down on the side of the road, would pull over and help you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know about Kevin, but no, give he me would. his number. He would. I- he would. <laughs> I, I, I assure you, he would. He's, you know, so, so it's, uh, yeah, Adam, I, I don't think Adam's belief system, uh, which is not to forgive promoting stuff like not wearing a mask and stuff. That's just, that's wrong and it causes harm. And so I'm curious uh, and Dr. Drew too. I mean, yeah, he was. Uh, are yeah. they different guys in the reruns? They, <laughs> no, no, not at all. They don't believe in bisexuals. Like you know, I mean, even Dr. Drew. 
Oh, especially Dr. Drew. He tells really? almost everyone by calling that they're confused. Um, you know, is they he like all- a Christian doctor? Like, what is it? First, what's he a doctor of? Like, I really a doctor of balsa wood aircraft assembly. To quote Sleepless in Seattle, his first name could be Doctor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, funny. that's the thing is, like, at the time, Adam's sort of like a libertarian, you know? He's like, legalized prostitution, legalized drugs. I mean, he, and then they have these weird, like, anti-trans views, and I, the, the, I mean, not weird, hateful, <laughs> um, uh-huh. which I don't know at this point how either of them feels. But, yeah, it was like... I'm not close to him, but I did just sort of on a one-on-one basis. I was like, oh, I really like this guy. Like I, we enjoyed working together. And so it's, it's just interesting that people sort of uh, decide I have to go all in this one bucket, you know, like, like remember when your, your views were sort of nuanced and unpredictable and, you know, uh, yeah, Yeah, exactly. it's, It's very strange. It's like, you have to, you have to say that white privilege doesn't exist and you shouldn't wear a mask. And it's like, well, I don't know. You're smarter than this. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing. You're smarter. Th- think this through. You're smarter than this. And how did your parents feel when you uh, became a comedian? Everyone in my family was pretty surprised at first because I didn't really speak as a child. <laughs> uh huh. And I had really, really bad stage fright, social anxiety to some extent, sometimes still do, but they did, you know, my whole family is very funny. So they weren't surprised by that part of it, but, but the attention sort of look at me part, I think was weird Uh, and is it's weird. It's a weird job to do, but, um, they were all, you know, my mom was very supportive. Oh, that's great. That's great. Still is. Yeah. Yeah. My, my parents were like, does it cost us money? Nope. Have at it. (laughs) Exactly. I think there was a little bit of at the beginning, and you've seen some of my stand up, like, oh, and you're going to talk about the family? Mm, yep, sure am. Okay. Right. I mean, they just sort of have to be prepared for it. Uh, I have uh, my first special coming out in February on Epics as a part of this um, Unprotected Sets series where it's 20 minutes of stand up and 10 minutes of interview. And, you know, it's all about my childhood and my family. So sometimes if there's new information that I'm putting on TV, I have to kind of prepare them, but they're all really supportive. It's just, but you know, my brother's in a punk band. He's been writing songs about our fucked up family for decades. So they were a little prepared for comedy to begin with, but yeah, they've been, she's been really supportive. She even, this is huge. For a boomer, as you know, sat down, and I'm not calling you one, but sat down and told me she was proud of me a few months ago. Her hands were shaking. (laughs) That's That's so funny. You know, my family's all like Dust Bowl Okies, so they're like, they don't talk about feelings. They just shove them right down. Uh, That was huge. Yeah, she's like, you did something scary and you went after it, and that's very, that's not it something people in our family do. So I'm really proud of you. That's huge. That's great. Yeah. My, uh, my brother once complimented me after a show by saying, Hey, I don't mean to compliment you, but that was pretty good. <laughs> That's sweet, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> that was, Oh, that wasn't Kevin. Kevin would just compliment me. That was Dick. Well, his real name is his nickname is Dick. His real name is penis. Thank you. These Dana are the jokes Gould, about everybody. my family when I was 60 years old. <laughs> This is the best, the, the best of my lunchroom set. <laughs> <laughs> my lunch, my my recess set. <laughs> well, anyway, what did tell? And uh, the pod, your podcast again is called. Who's your god? Who's your god? I'd love to have you on if you're interested. I'd love to be on it. Yeah. Yeah, we interview mostly comedians about their religious and spiritual beliefs. It's been really fun and fascinating, and it's also let's do funny. it. Let's do it. Who And uh, do you have a partner on the podcast? You go right in. I have a partner, Steve Hernandez, he used to be a mega church pastor in Covina. And yeah, we wow. have a good time. It's, it's a lot of fun for we the should, subject yeah. matter. No, that's it's interesting. What I find interesting is, and I don't know what this says about me, it's more psychological, I think, than religious. My, my mom was a Christian evangelical. And also super into astrology and crystals and witchcraft and whatever. And my, my mom is, is, is still physically alive, but she has a dementia and lives in a facility and 
doesn't know who I am kind of thing. So she's here, but not here. And yet with, although that, so she is absent in my life, but now Kat, my girlfriend has completely filled the vacuum where like she knows as much about astrology as my mother does. Like, I've got to listen to where my moon is. <laughs> and <laughs> so she just came, she, she and my daughter one day, like, where are you guys? We're going to the crystal show. Okay, great. You know, <laughs> so they came right in. I apparently need to have that voice in my life. Yeah, scotch and stars. Scotch and stars. Yeah, <laughs> boy, that's her in a nutshell. Whis- whiskey and witchcraft. Um, <laughs> These are all great podcast ideas, Kat. We're giving you gold. Exactly. Do it. Um, <laughs> super cool. Well, Amy, thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you. This was so fun. The podcast is called Who's Your God? And your special is called? It's just, it's. they're called Unprotected Sets. Unprotected Do Sets. Do you get it? I do. Dana, what they did is on the poster, they made a bunch of microphones that look like sperm. Oh, yay. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Dana Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out.